Uh, good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting, September 19th. All selectmen are present except for Selectman Kalenda. I will be chairing in his place. Um, Mr. Purple, 6.30 p.m. hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, South Florida Board of Selectmen shall hold a public hearing Tuesday, September 19th, 6.30 p.m. in the McAuliffe hearing room. Southboro Townhouse 17 Common Street, Southboro Mass to consider a petition by Verizon New England Incorporated, Mass Electric Company, uh, National Grid for joint or identical pole location on the easterly side of Middle Road at a point approximately 1,390 feet southerly from the center line of Boston Worcester Turnpike as shown in Verizon Plan number 1A2DQRX. All interested parties are encouraged to attend. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, this afternoon, um, we were informed that uh, Verizon um, did not send out the abutters notices for this hearing as required uh, and therefore um, the hearing cannot be held. Verizon is made aware of that and uh, they are going to be refiling it at some point but there is no action for the board to take on this this evening. Uh, if you simply um, would close the hearing um, then, then that will put that matter to rest and Verizon will have to refile. Is there a motion to close the hearing? I'll second the motion. Motion is moved, seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> uh, so our next hearing is at 645, but we're going to have to wait uh, until then to do that. Uh, Mr. Malinowski, so if you want to provide us a uh, quick update on the public safety building project. Thank you, Mr. Shea. So uh, I think I briefed you about a month ago, and I have a feeling this is going to be a regular occurrence over the next couple of months. Uh, the past month has been uh, spent uh, primarily by the architect and our owner's project manager uh, working in the background uh, doing what they call design development. They're about, it's a 10-week process. They're about five weeks through it. Um, at the end of that process is when they would then submit their formal applications in plans to the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, and Board of Health. Um, so far, so good. Um, nothing really has changed substantially from what was uh, proposed at town meeting. Um, some of the rooms, the walls have changed a little bit, but um, we have been assured that any of the, the cosmetic changes that you'd really have to actually put floor plan next to floor plan to actually even see the difference. Um, would, none of that will relate actually to extra cost, which um, our committee remains laser focused on. Uh, last night, um, I know a few of you actually were in attendance. Uh, we had a joint meeting with the golf course committee, followed by a joint meeting combined with conservation planning and board of health. Um, we are trying to stay ahead of everything and solicit feedback real time, as opposed to um, learning some lessons the hard way when we actually get to the formal regulatory process. Um, I found the uh, session incredibly informative and I just based on the conversation that the committee had after uh, those boards left, you know, I think we, we, learned, we took, we had a few good takeaways of where we need to focus. Um, our next steps are really as follows of kind of the next month is um, once we have a better plan, like and we've actually had some more engineering done, uh, we want to have a public information session. Um, it will primarily be geared towards the abutters. We would hope that we would, because we're going to have to get the abutters list anyways for planning board purposes, that they would receive a notification where they could come and air their feedback to our consultants ahead of the formal process. That way, um, you know, should there be feedback that can be incorporated, it would be, might, it would be nice to have that in the original application of planning um, as a po or conservation or board of health depending upon the particular item as opposed to trying to react after the fact given those boards don't meet all the time and we have to follow their schedule we're not going to really be able to dictate any of that. Um, so that is hopefully coming early October but we're going to wait to get kind of the go ahead because we don't want to share kind of a half-baked plan. We want a formal plan that that's what we're going to planning and conservation with absent any other feedback. Of course, that would be open to the broader community as well, but we think we have, uh, given the interactions the Public Safety Study Committee had with the Latasquama Road area um, during the process over the winter, it behooves us to do the same thing um, again ahead of time. So um, I would say that's the positive. I would say where there is a lot of work that's going to require not only input from your board, but I think many other boards, committees, and just people that can think outside the box is 
um, how we integrate the golf course into this plan. So um, there's been discussion at this, these meetings in the past, but also our meetings, golf course committee meetings. There's obviously no funding currently to do anything for the golf course committee. The 22.6 million um, that was allocated plus the land purchase at town meeting is for public safety in those uses alone. Um, what we're hearing from planning, at least on an informal basis, is um, they would like to see a complete plan, right? So if we situate public safety and we situate the septic field and all of that, and then all of a sudden, a year down the road, the town comes and says, well, we want to put a clubhouse in this spot. Well, they might say, well, we would have probably told you to design the public safety differently if we had known that that was coming. So um, while nothing has been formally ironed out in 24 hours, um, the, the plan of our committee, we're meeting again next Monday, um, and my goal at that meeting is to maybe see if there's a way that as part of our plans, we can show hypothetically where a golf course, club, where a clubhouse would go, where a septic field for that clubhouse would go, and where a parking lot would go. Therefore, that plan could be submitted as a all-in to the planning board, and then should the town decide not to fund that in any way, shape, or form, you still have gone with kind of a, the full plan, and if you take something away from the plan, that's not gonna impact what we're doing for public safety, as opposed to going with just public safety and have someone bolted on at the end. So that's what we have to figure out in a very, very short period of time, and um, I think the golf course committee fully appreciates that as well. I'm just not sure that they have enough horsepower there yet, right? They're just getting started, so we're trying to do everything we can acting within the bounds of our charge to try to advance that so we don't run into a situation where planning or conservation has an issue with the public safety design because they don't understand the periphery, uh, the peripheral areas. Um, so that, that's where we're going with all of this. Um, should there be any kind of gray area that we run into, we're gonna come running back to you for guidance and feedback, but I think otherwise we're gonna run into a situation where uh, construction will start late and then that will have a far greater cost impact to the town um, than you know spending two or three hours now to figure out where a septic field will go. Um, you'll start to see some equipment out on the golf course. They're digging the borings, I believe, on Thursday, or starting at least with Board of Health um, to test to make sure that the place where we have the septic is the right place and the Board of Health is involved with that. So all of that's the good news. The bad news is just kind of trying to find a way to situate golf. The one other, I'll call it, item that needs to be addressed is with the school committee. So um, I've been in contact with the chair of the school committee. Um, they need to give guidance on whether in the short term they're going to be pursuing tying into the access driveway um, for the public safety um, visitor parking or not. The reason that matters now is that could impact planning board's decision on what needs to be done from a traffic light at that intersection and what sort of traffic studies they would like to see conducted. So uh, the chairman of the school committee, I'm fully confident that he got the message that they need to take some or give some direction that that's a five-year item, at which case we'll present plans that clearly truncate our driveway and they'll have to deal with the planning board process down the road. Or if they say that's something they want to explore, again, we will include it in our plan. That will be gets presented to planning and then we'll let the town decide with the school committee and the voters um, how to fund that, because that's obviously outside of our charge. So that's my update. I don't know if there's any questions or comments from the board. So I'll just start with one brief comment. Thank you very much for having that meeting and inviting the other boards and committees last night. I think it's important to get them involved in the process early. Um, and, you know, and I did hear the requests that planning board made, the conservation commission name uh, made with respect to deliverables to them, and those boards commissions do a great job. Um, again, in the spirit of cooperation, I hope, and this is not to say that we should give them anything less than what they're looking for, but you know, this is not the Malinowski Corporation putting Super Walmart 
on, on that parcel. This is a, you know, a public project, overwhelmingly supported at town meeting, then supported overwhelmingly at a ballot vote as well uh, to exempt the, the, t um, the debt from the taxes. So uh, there's a lot of eyes that are looking on this project and hopefully everybody can continue to work together and, and deliver this the way that everybody's hoping that it will be. Jason, I did watch watch it from my home last night. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces from what I was gathering. From the scope of the town meeting warrant article, the fund, if there is funding necessary for some of these smaller things that you just suggested, we're within the scope of that funding source to add the septic consideration, the the lot itself, the engineering component to address the needs of the golf course in the future on a bigger scope. So we can get to the point that you want to within the scope of that warrant article. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think where, where there's any gray area, um, obviously we're gonna direct those to Mr. Purple and he's gonna probably have to get the advice of town council based on how um, the warrant article was written. I, I do think we're not talking about money in terms of design. Correct. We're talking about money in terms of how you execute some of these things. So an example is the clubhouse. I, it's my understanding that an opinion has been rendered that that clubhouse can be picked up and moved. We would have had to demolish it anyway. So there was already funding to demolish it. How much is it to pick up and move and is that an additional cost? I just think we need to keep a inventory of these because what I have committed to the advisory committee is that anything we are doing to alter our project budget, even if within the 22.6, um, we will outline that so that they could just right. see the impact that the golf course and the desire to have the continued operations is having on our project. Because, again... Well, you have a timeline, and I want, I want that timeline to stay focused mm -hmm. because we, we all agreed on that. And I think anyone that has a suggestion or assumes something should really be committed to the same timeline to meet your goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you, Jason. Um, also, I was at the meeting last night as well, and um, I, I think your committee is doing a fabulous job. Um, one question I will ask, because I noticed you mentioned the separate septic. Is that, has that been decided? I know the question came up on it last night, if there was the any The architect asked for this week to validate okay. that, because he, he, he needs to go to his engineer. Um, my presumption is they want to see how those borings go in the middle of the week, and I think because they're all beyond the site, they'll be able to kind of do some investigatory work in terms of how that will all fit in. Okay, I just want The to answers that were given last night, that he was given last night, were the answers that were given last winter in terms of how that would factor in. Okay, so I just wanted to verify it's, it's not a done deal, so to speak, that there's not an opportunity potentially there. So we just don't know the answer yet still. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 645 hearing? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Purple. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, notice is hereby given under Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws that New Rose Garden Incorporated, DBA New Rose Garden, has applied for an alteration of premises for its restaurant all alcoholic beverage license. On the premises located at 1 South Phil Road, South Borough, Mass, described as a first floor, 4,000 square foot, five room building with one entrance and three exits, proposed seating capacity of 88, proposed occupancy of 99. Uh, public hearing will be held in the Thomas W. McAuliffe hearing room, second floor of the townhouse, 17 Common Street, South Borough, Mass, on Tuesday, September 19th, 2017 at 6.45 p.m. Right. So thank you and, uh, and welcome if you could just uh, state your names and who you're with and just a quick uh, description of what you're proposing for your Yes, restaurant. good afternoon. My name is Andrea Cole. I'm the power legal working for attorney Chris Coleman's office. Tonight I represent the applicant New Walls Garden on, uh, on the application of the alteration of the premises. Uh, we got the transfer approval last agenda and being approved by the ABCC as well. This time we are going to um, to apply for uh, to propose a valuation to install a sushi bar in the dining room of the restaurant. Um, the proposed uh, alteration doesn't change the the total seating capacity will remain unchanged. So we'll be happy to answer if the board have any questions. Okay. 
No, I recall this comment being made when you were here last. That's that, right. um, Just that this because would be coming of the as well, uh, so. notice to about us, we, we, we decided to do the two applications separately. Yep. Okay. So uh, I personally have no questions. <coughs> no questions. No. No questions. Um, anybody from the public with comment? Question. Sir, yes, if you could please go to the uh, microphone. From Ashland, Mass. Okay. Um, and just curious, is it going to remain a, a restaurant? Is it going to be any entertainment or anything like that there? Uh, we don't propose any live entertainment from now. Uh, the only mm -hmm. maybe consider as entertainment is just a couple of TVs and the background music. Okay. It's not going to become a nightclub or anything like that? No, definitely not. Okay. <laughs> we are a family restaurant. That's my, <coughs> that's my concern. Yeah. So and would that require uh, coming back and to us if that, yes. if that change yes. was yes. going to happen? Yes. yes. So that would be require a refiling okay. uh, for that Another change. Another butter's notice, too. And, and a butter's notice if that change were to occur. Okay. So there's just going to be renovations to make and upgrade the restaurant? Um, just install a sushi bars, they will add sushi Japanese food into the menu. Okay. So they will install a new sushi bar there to provide sushi, sashimi, and samaki Japanese style. Okay. Yeah. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yes, please. Hi, Karen Allers. Just two houses up from the gentleman before me in Ashland where behind you guys. And I'm just wondering if any consideration has been given to putting a fence behind the property um, because it is all three sides of this restaurant um, are bordered by homes. Re it's, a re it's a residential neighborhood that this property is in. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had g given consideration to, I know there's a fence on the sides, but not in the back where our properties abut. Um, as because they don't own the property. They just, you know, getting into the business, going to want the business. They were happy to, you know, discuss this matter with the landlord <coughs> who owns the property and see what, what their planning will be. But I can't answer yes or no now until they have the chance to propose, to, 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 to introduce your proposal to the property owner. Okay. Yeah. That's just something that I know the property owners that live behind would be interested in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, I will move to close the public hearing. Is there a second to close the hearing? Second. second. All those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, any discussion on the application? Uh, I will move uh, to grant the application for the alteration of premises for New Rose Garden. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, do you want to go to Brian to get him out? Yep. All right. So I'm going to go um, out of order next just so we can have Mr. Ballantyne make his quick presentation and he can then be on his way. Uh, so we're going to jump to the town administrator's report uh, with the FY19 capital plan. Mr. Chairman, just to introduce this a little bit, um, obviously we're getting back into budget season and uh, the first item we start to take a look at while departments are preparing their operating budgets is their capital and uh, those requests have come in to the finance director and Brian's been compiling those and we've been working with advisory to try and take a look at um, maybe a different way of, of presenting this information so it's a little bit better. I think, um, you know, in, an, in another um, uh, budget year, probably next year, not this budget year, you'll probably be seeing, you know, a, a smaller type of our budget book, a smaller book simply for capital to explain, you know, the plan, to understand the projects moving forward so everybody gets comfortable with what projects are the one-off projects, what projects are the ones that are reoccurring in terms of replacement equipment, things like that. So I just wanted Brian to come in. You've had it in your packets. It's been up online. Advisory has a copy, and we're going to be speaking to them next week about it. But I wanted Brian just to give a quick um, overview of, of the information uh, that you have in your packets. And, and don't worry, there will be more to, to come on this. So, mm -hmm. so we have the um, uh, capital plan, as the town administrator mentioned, um, about nine or 10 pages worth. It looks a little different this year um, in the way it's set up. So I'm going to give the very brief version, five minutes. 
so the, the um, as you know, we deferred some capital from last year, uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth. Um, we knew this would be uh, an issue for FY19. So capital is divided into several sections. Um, it, like I said, we'll keep it at the summary level. There is debt, which is current debt we have, future debt we anticipate. <coughs> and within those two sections, there's debt that's the tax levy, or the tax bills, the tax you know, general fund. And then there's other funds, which is cap, uh, things such as water, ambulance fund, um, et cetera. Uh, within uh, the other section is uh, appropriations, which are capital items such as um, you know the DPW equipment or copiers, maybe things like that. Um, and again, within those sections, there are things funded by uh, other funds or by the tax levy. So I'm going to concentrate on the general fund because that's really the most important thing um, as we develop the budget. Not that the others aren't important, they'll be reviewed and we need to make sure that the funding can fit into those other funding sources. However, the, the general fund is really we wanna uh, pay close attention to. And for next year, and these are relatively new numbers that we'll, we'll be uh, massaging over the next couple months with advisory and among ourselves, the, um, the general fund capital appropriations and, and possible future debt is about $925,000 more for next year alone. So it's a good amount, and um, you know that that does include the public safety building. It also includes all the money that we're taking off the books for the schools and, and other items. So when you you kind of net that all out, um, we've got about a 38 cent tax increase on the tax rate, which is a couple of hundred dollars on the tax bill. Now it, it was interesting listening to Jason a little bit because we we know we're facing some things we haven't appropriated or or we may have to consider other items. Um, I would caution the board to, to be very careful with this. Um, we get into these bonded projects and we know we have several out there and we're starting to sort of pile them up and this will hit the tax bills and it's going to be it's going to be a big sting and when that happens it sort of refreshes your memory of all the decisions that were made that led up to it. So as far as the golf course, uh, as Mrs. Fan alluded to, the money for the golf, as I understand, the money for any kind of holes or tee boxes, is not part of the loan authorization. So mm -hmm. there's things out there we just have to be real careful how we're approaching. Our free cash was down. Looks like it's going to be down. We haven't finalized it. Uh, several hundred thousand for next year, uh, for next year's available budget. Um, the school, uh, who has been very generous the past few years, um, may have a, a, an increase that might be slightly higher for next year. So we do, you know, this is only part of the budget. It's, it's a piece of it. It's an important piece. This year, it's a big piece. It sometimes is not this big of an issue, but with this debt that we're, that's out there hanging, um, it's, it's gonna be a heavy weight. And um, I, the purpose of tonight was just to sort of lay the groundwork and say there's a lot here. We've deferred some things. I, I'd be very reluctant to go forward and say we, need to defer a bunch of other things because that's kicking the can down the road to the next year or the year after where you're faced with potentially a worse problem. Um, so as usual, we'll work hard to try to fit everything in the, in the boxes that we have, but um, it looks like we're gonna have about $3 million or, or close to it of levy capacity, which again, we're gonna revisit in a few weeks or a month when the assessor does his recap. Um, but again, that means using that means the tax bills again. So it's all back to the tax rate is my point. And um, keeping that down is, is gonna be a challenge. So um, as we go along, if anyone has any questions of the board on specific items, which we'll revisit later uh, when the town administrator and myself do the budget presentation, we'll be doing a preliminary one um, next month. Um, that's probably more an appropriate forum to, to get into the real details, but <coughs> So just wanted to give the board an opportunity. I think the town administrator also wanted to give the board an opportunity to see these sort of gross numbers and uh, gross in many ways, they're gross, but they're gross. <laughs> and say, you know, and, and be cautioned um, as we go along with this fiscal year. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the update. Actually, no comments or questions from I you, have Ms. one quick question. I know it was sent to the advisory committee. Have mm -hmm. they? Had a discussion around this yet? No, they, we actually finalized uh, the 
final uh, copy today. It is with advisory now. All right, but they um, have, they have had not a had a discussion. discussion. Next okay. Wednesday will be their first discussion on this. Very valuable information, and $200, like you said, is a sting for the average household valuation. So we need to be monitoring that. Thank you. Okay. All set? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to jump ahead on the consent agenda item while Brian is still here to number eight. Um, we discussed this last time, but uh, finally to approve the employment agreement for finance director, for treasurer collector. Mr. Ballantyne, is there a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion. Oh, first I want to say that I ask that it be held. Uh, Mrs. Braccio, myself, and town administrator, and Brian, we met twice, uh, went through the entire draft at that time to come up with the printed document in this evening's packet. Mr. Purple, Mrs. Braccio, and myself went to the personnel board. We explained to them we were going into a contract, uh, had discussions about a contract, and the final version's before you this evening. Um, I have no questions with it. I think it's very clean, unless Mark has something else to add to that. No, I'm all, I'm all set with it. I appreciate the effort that the board has put into this, and. Um, I know that um, I know that Mr. Ballantyne is 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 pleased with it as well. Okay. Great. I'll make a motion to approve the employment agreement for the finance director slash treasurer collector Brian Ballantyne for 2007 to 2000 uh, 2017 to 2020. Second. It's moved, seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Brian. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to scheduled appointments. Uh, appointment number four, Mr. Cipriano, update on the draft conservation restriction for St. Mark's Golf Course. Mr. Chairman, would you like myself and the attorney sure. to come sure. forward? Sure. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to introduce, if I may, attorney Luke Legere of the law firm of McGregor Legere. I've worked with Luke for a few years now on other environmental matters, and I've actually had the honor of working with Greg McGregor on and off for over 30 years. And I believe that this law firm, with its background, is best qualified to assist in creating a very comprehensive final draft conservation restriction relative to the golf course property. Now, we have so far created, or I had created, initial two drafts of the, of the conservation restriction. But we wanted the opportunity for you to meet Attorney Legere and to hear also if there were any comments or input from the Board of Selectmen and if there are any additional comments in public session from any of the commissions that have already furnished uh, initial comments. Uh, and the purpose would be then after this evening a third and very comprehensive draft would then be created and then recirculated to town boards. We believe that that's the appropriate approach uh, so that uh, Attorney Legere gets a good sense of everybody's commentaries and gets to maybe see or meet the, uh, the role players in the government that are going to continue forward in the next several months to a final draft of the conservation restriction. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, and good evening. Thank you for the kind introduction, Attorney Cipriano. We're certainly very uh, pleased to be here meeting with you tonight and working for you and the town of Southborough on this project uh, as well. This is right up our alley. As Attorney Cipriano indicated, we work on all manner of environmental law. We've drafted many, many conservation restrictions over the years, uh, and we're looking forward to picking up the baton here that now that uh, town council has gotten the process rolling. Mm -hmm. He'll be handing the baton off to us, and we're, we're glad to take it and run from here. Uh, as he indicated, we've now received the memos that were submitted to the selectmen from the Conservation Commission, uh, as well as the Open Space Preservation Commission here in town. So we've had a chance to review those, digest those. Uh, this is an opportunity now to hear further feedback from the selectmen. Anyone else who's here and interested this evening, uh, we'll take that all back to the shop and come back to you with a, a very comprehensive uh, new iteration of that conservation restriction, which will account for everything that we have heard from the various uh, constituents and, and parties in interest here. 
And I'll just add that this is all consistent with the vote that was taken at the special town meeting for this article um, that authorized the, the Board of Selectmen to engage the services of an attorney specializing in conservation restrictions who shall work in conjunction with Town Council and the Open Space Preservation Commission as advisors to draft the conservation restriction. So we have a draft. Uh, I know that we do have uh, comments back from Open Space Preservation Commission. Uh, as I understand, our Conservation Commission has also offered comments uh, as well. Uh, you know, at this time, my, you know, I don't have additional comments to add on top of those, but you know, we just you know request that you go through the comments that those boards and commissions have um, have come up with for incorporation into the next draft. We're going to do that, and the the comments that came from both commissions um, are, are well-founded inquiries and really set the the pace going forward of uh, the kind of concerns that you would have for this type of a conservation restriction specifically because it's somewhat of the unique nature of creating a conservation restriction on the significant portion of the land, cutting out a public safety facility on a small portion of the land, but also making that conservation restriction uh, and what was intended by the town meeting and all the people that were involved in speaking at the town meeting uh, be consistent with the intent of also uh, having a reconfigured golf course and have recreational uses to the property. All of those things are, are part of the challenge to get this thing done, but uh, it's all doable and it has been done in the past and it has been approved by the state agencies. Other comments, Ms. Braschio? Um, I have a few comments, actually. Um, um, can you... I'm, I'm not familiar with your firm, and I'm sure many in the room are not familiar sure. with your firm. Um, have you done any conservation restrictions involving a golf course or anything similar in this nature? Uh, I'm just curious. I, I know you mentioned your background. You've done many CRs, sure. but I, I'm just curious. Sure. Uh, we have not, um, and I would, I would add that these types of conservation restrictions are, are fairly uncommon. Uh, as town council alluded to. They're not unprecedented by any stretch. Uh, certainly there are three or four that I could think of off the top of my head that I'm familiar with uh, and have reviewed and certainly will be uh, taking into consideration as we're going back and, and revising the draft of your conservation restriction. But uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, these are, again, fairly uncommon. So not unprecedented, somewhat uncommon. Uh, so we haven't had the opportunity to work on a on this specific type of a conservation restriction previously, mm -hmm. uh, but we're certainly happy to have the opportunity and more than comfortable to go ahead with doing that. Okay. Um, I have comments, I don't know if, if, if it's for a later discussion when it's open space and I'm sure conservation has comments um, or I can just bring some up now. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's up it, to you. It's fine with me, I mean, um, one of the things I, I would hope we would consider tonight is I know open space and conservation both uh, were interested in doing having a working group. Um, I know in this draft, if I'm not mistaken, the co one of the co-holders is conservation. So I would hope we would give consideration to um, requests by them as far as what they need um, and with open space also working in conjunction with this. So again, I'd like to hear from them as well, but that's another one of the comments that I had. And, and again, it's up for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'll, I'll refrain from further comments. Okay. For now. Ms. Fanner? Uh, a question as far as the draft that's stated June 14th. The comments from conservation and open space, are they referencing the June 14th draft? Do we know? Their, their memorandum that went to you, uh, Attorney Cipriano, as far as the comments on the St. Mark's draft conservation restriction, are they reference, are their comments reference, referencing this draft? Well, you I know? Their, their comments was, uh, were dated July 3rd and July right. 10th, respectively, and uh, I believe that that draft was furnished. Okay, that's all for now, thank you. But I must say that that, that is really a, 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 I know, it's a, work. a, a bare bones initial. And I, I have to tell you that I was the one who 
thinking about this, this again is not something that should just go to a land foundation because it's too compellingly uh, principal or, or specific to the town. So the theory was to have the Conservation Commission, the best suited uh, agency, participate. And I know that some people have referenced the so-called merger issue, um, but a merger issue does not happen unless an entity holds both sides similar to a trust without any third party involved. So the information that I have from DHCD, and I'll, I'll let uh, the law firm uh, pick up on that as they pr proceed, is that as long as a conservation commission or a similar agency is involved together with a land foundation, a, a bona fide land foundation, then merger is not an issue. So you're hoping that you get the best of, of two aspects, the land foundation involvement, but the, the town oversight permanently by a conservation commission. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, I know that there are a uh, number of town boards and committees present. If you, if you would like to make, offer comments, uh, if you could please go to the microphone. Freddie. Hi, I'm Freddie Gillespie, the chair of the Open Space Preservation Commission. And our commission actually wrote the amendment that was approved at town meeting. We did a lot of research and our due diligence prior to writing this. And I'm going to say that um, I don't believe the process to date has met the intent or the requirement of what the citizens voted on, um, specifically in relationship to the role of the Open Space Preservation Commission. I'm trying to find where it is here. Okay. The Board of Selectmen shall engage the services of an attorney specializing in conservation restrictions, check, who shall work in conjunction with town council, check, and the Open Space Preservation Commission as advisors to draft a conservation restriction. I don't think that burden has been met. I think the intent was we would be working in conjunction. I looked it up in the dictionary. We knew what we were saying when we wrote it. Working together not getting a draft, we had no idea what was going into it, and being offered the opportunity to make comments like anyone else. And I think there's problems with what was in the draft, and I approach this differently, sorry, I'm a little shaky. Um, I approached this differently the first two meetings because I had high hopes that this would, in fact, be a collaborative process. We did not even get the courtesy of acknowledgement that they received our comments July 10th. We didn't get invited to this meeting until the last minute, so we didn't even have time to post a meeting. That is not collaboration. This is a silo approach. Attorneys doing it, feeding it back to us. It's not collaboration. What we envisioned and what I believe the townspeople want and wanted at town meeting, when we brought the land trust, the land's open space the neighborhood came to support the compromise position, which allowed the public safety building to move forward. That overwhelming vote in support of this project envisioned a collaborative approach for developing the CR. I'm going to talk about a couple of the things. For example, the neighborhood. It's, it's small things, but they mean a lot. Lights. If the golf course fails, what can the buildings be used for? What about the parking? What time? Operation? All of those things need to be vetted in a place where people feel they have a voice. The Open Space Preservation Commission. If the golf course fails, what can be done in the future? This is forever. This isn't just for the short term we have a golf course. Who knows if golf goes on in the future? We hope to see it continue. The golfers. Let's make sure the golf course is adequately considered what they want, but also let's adequately consider the impact of that to the um, conservation values. What type of chemicals? How often? Where's the management plan? These aren't things that I believe, with all due respect, for a feeling of collaboration that this town wants on a project of this magnitude and the effort that went in to getting it passed at town meeting that should be done by two attorneys in a room who give it back to us for us to review and say that's what we want. I don't think that's what's intended and I think the fact that we asked for a subcommittee made up with the various parties I've just mentioned, 
neighborhood, open space, recreation, golfers, conservation, the land trust. I think that's the way to go, and the fact that here we are, how many months later, and we haven't gotten that? The golf course and the um, public safety building are moving ahead. The golf course is making plans without knowing how that might be negatively impacted by the conservation restriction and not allowed. The conservation restriction needs to be developed knowing what the golf course needs. Where's the building envelope? The fact that this draft identified two parties to hold the CR without anyone discussing that, that's not the way you do a collaborative approach. Conservation Commission got it listed as being a co-holder and had never been told. I believe to this time, the South Broken Land Foundation has never been notified officially that they were looking at. The Open Space Preservation Commission has done our due diligence. We know that SALT is one option. We also believe a better option, I shouldn't say better, an alternative would be having the Sudbury Valley trustees hold it. We've had conversations. They're willing to consider it. You know, that's the sort of thing, you know, our commission does. We've been working really hard on this for over a year. We have a lot of information. We don't get to provide that information, that input, that feeling of the neighborhood and all the conversations we've had by writing a letter. It's not right, and I really suggest you form that committee tonight. It was recommended by your Open Space Preservation Commission, who specifically is called out in the Warren article that was overwhelmingly passed at town meeting, and your Conservation Commission, who was one of the, um, at the time, right now, identified as hold, being a co-holder of the restriction. We could have told the conservation restriction that yes, you can put a uh, conservation restriction on a golf course. We knew that. I talked with a woman who actually wrote the handbook for conservation restrictions for the Commonwealth. She also was in charge of approving the conservation restrictions for numerous, numerous years. She gave me wonderful free advice. You can put a CR on a golf course and a, a conservation commission can co-hold. She's an attorney in private practice, and she went to the State Ethics Building, uh, sorry, the State Ethics Commission to ensure that she could speak to me because she had been employed by the state. We do our due diligence, we check our facts, and we make sure we're not crossing any ethical lines. We're not only ourselves, but we work with other people. And I think you're doing a disservice by being at this point tonight and not having a conservation restriction subcommittee group and the fact that no one has even had the courtesy to contact the Open Space Commission and have a conversation with us about this aside from we're having a meeting to discuss it you can show up here's a draft conservation restriction you can make comments on it and I will say that draft conservation restriction had so many areas I couldn't even begin to write how many things we had issues with or would want to see added or changed and in final comment in Everyone has a role. The lawyers do the legal piece, but you need the people who voted for this to sit down together and say, this is what we want, this is what we want in it. Then the lawyers take it and craft it. This is the Open Space Commission's vision. They craft it, not beforehand. They craft what the people want, <clears throat> the various really dedicated advocates for this project, and then they have to negotiate with the parties that are going to hold it. They negotiate with the Conservation Commission if they're one and with the Land Trust if they're another one. And they may say some of the things the neighbors and the, um, not the neighbors, the subcommittee, the stakeholders want don't fly or aren't going to work for them. Then you come back and you rediscuss it. But you don't have, I'm sorry, but two men sitting in a room making these kinds of decisions for a community on a project of this magnitude that is forever. Thank you. Can I go back go ahead. to the article that was approved at town meeting and what was read, Mr. Shea? Is this the same one? In fairness to the previous speaker, it does say that open space would be a collaborative member. So how much time, I'm, I'm looking at I agree with everything you said, Ms. Gillespie, but we have to get this moving. We can't have a lot of meetings and they have, if you're saying open to the public, which I agree with, they have to happen soon. 
as far as the openness and the committee members need to be appointed and they have to really be committed to this to see it through. I mean, we're, we have attorneys, they're gonna want feedback, but it can't go on forever. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm trying to get to the end result. Okay, so first of all, we wrote the Warren article. I understand. We know the deadline and the timing. We were here and I, I specifically, we were ready to roll you know, April 29th, okay? We have done our background work. The neighbors have been involved, the, the neighborhood have been involved for over a year. They've been um, living there for a long time. I think they're pretty ready to know what their types of things they want. The golfers are ready. Recreation, conservation, I think the Conservation Commission knows their conservation laws. I don't think this is rocket science. I don't think it takes two million meetings. I think, you know, when was the first meeting? It was before the July one. We, I specifically said then, there's things you need to consider, and it's budgetary with CPA money or other monies. I mean, you haven't even approached a land trust to, to do this. Do you understand that they will probably require an endowment? How much money? Where you gonna get it? Now I've been bringing this up and I've been beating this over and over again at every meeting that we had these three trains on separate tracks and they needed to be moving along at the same time. Not, and once pulled way out, the fact that we're here tonight and don't have a committee set up, I agree that's a problem, but I guarantee I'm willing to work or whoever else from my commission was appointed and I bet we can find dedicated people from the neighborhood, from the golfers, and from conservation that are ready to roll up our sleeves and get this done. I don't see it as, you know, just for us to take, make a comment, let's put it this way, for us to make a comment to respond to a draft that comes out, my commission has to find a night, we can have a quorum, that we can post a meeting and we can meet, and then we have to discuss it, and then someone has to write that letter which is not um, on time consuming. I don't see the difference between setting up a subcommittee to do that same sort of thing because not only would open space have to do that, conservation has to do it, all the other entities. Public meeting law has to be abided by no matter whether it's a subcommittee or if you're having the commissions that are reviewing this in charge. I don't see it taking much longer and I think it's going to, in the long run, take much shorter because you're not going to have people coming to a public meeting when you're ready to sign it freaking out and saying no way or the land trust saying no way. I mean, land trusts know what goes in a conservation restriction. They can help guide us. I mean, I don't see this as taking, I don't think the public should suffer because the process to set up this committee has taken, um, three months longer than it should have. Okay, thank you. Mark, I don't know if you wanted to make a comment as well. <clears throat> um, yeah, Mark Possumato, Conservation Commission. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, you know, Freddie said quite a bit there, so a um, couple of comments is, is you have the letter from the Conservation Commission, so the commission put that together as a commission, you know, submitted it um, against the draft that, that was reviewed um, I, I think, you know, the comments in there, you know, we stand by those. We also, in that letter, um, recommended that a subcommittee be put together as well. Uh, we have expertise in our commission of writing conservation restrictions. I think they could be of use to, to the attorneys doing this, as well as uh, open space and the other boards that are, that are interested in the neighbors and the golfers. Um, it's kind of a big deal, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a sensitive deal, too. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, moving forward with a subcommittee and you know, gathering all that expertise that, that we have that we can tap and put together, I think, um, I think would, be, uh, would be beneficial to everybody. And, you know, I think, um, you know, in terms of timing and whatnot, you know, I mean, people have schedules and so forth, but, you know, I know that uh, we have members on our board that, that would be committed to do this, you know, and, and work with, you know, whomever, you know, in the subcommittee to, to move this forward. A question, Mr. Pesmano, could yeah. you, have joint meetings televised with the residents so the questions can be answered and the other and other citizens can hear the answers and the responses. It makes it a lot easier. 
I mean, we're talking. You're not about, setting me up I here, mean, are you? No. <laughs> no, but if you're talking about a project of this size, I, I, don't, I don't believe anybody here this evening was going to sign this, um, <laughs> in fairness to the residents and this board. Um, but if, if we're talking about joint, a partnership of open space and conservation, I see no reason that it can't be a scheduled meeting and this be the only topic and the public be invited to that. So questions can yeah, be asked of the committees representing them, their membership, the entire membership at a regular board meeting. To yeah, me, I it can, seems I don't see why not. more open to include everybody and they can see a tape if, you know, if they can't come to a meeting and ask the questions, send questions back. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I don't see why not. Okay, no, it's a big project. May I respond to that because um, I think that could be part of the process. I don't think it should take the place of a subcommittee where people can sit around a table. I've been to joint meetings, and the same amount of work does not get done. You sit there, you present, people talk, you hear. It's different when you have the representatives from the stakeholders sitting at a table, talking back and forth, coming up with ideas, then do a joint meeting with the Open Space Commission and Conservation, and present something and let everyone weigh in. To develop the small little nitty gritty things, a subcommittee. Are there other um, town boards or committees that wanted to offer comments? No. Anybody from the public? Yeah. My name is David. My name is David Parry. I'm sorry I came in late, but I, I don't understand what, what, it, what is the problem with setting up a subcommittee as being suggested as a working group? I don't know that anybody said there was uh, a problem. I see, okay, just wondering. All right, so. Ms. Braschio. Um, I would just like to say that, that I, I also agree that this, this is um, an, an important step to take, I think, I don't know that the town has ever done a CR of this magnitude mm -hmm. uh, with the support from the public um, that it's had. And I, for one, would um, be in favor, as Mrs. Fan have said, and I'm sure you, yourself as well, to have a transparent process where everyone feels their voice is heard and get the CR done, get it done right the first time. Mm -hmm. So we're not back talking about this again. Yep. So that's, that's my thoughts, and I. I think we should move forward with that. So, and how do we want to move forward with that? I know that it wasn't specifically, you know, noted in the agenda that we're going to create a working group tonight. Uh, as far as membership, we don't know if the charge, duration, I don't know if we want to provide comments to, to Mr. Purple to consider, you know, a charge in appointing this group uh, at our next meeting. I do agree that we need to act fast in getting this group together. Um, but. I, well, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it tonight. Thanks. Well, I wasn't suggesting a separate committee. I was suggesting that two committees, conservation, open space, have a joint meeting, do it in a very public forum, and that the residents participate in that forum. And any feedback they get, town council's aware of. Mm -hmm. And we, we will be aware and we'll be attending them if we can. We'll be at the meetings asking us some of the same questions. But I'm not in favor of subcommittees because then they're eventually going to have to report to two committees now open space will have to report to open space conservation is going to have to re get a weigh in on their committee and then it's all going to come back here i think it there's no reason it can't be streamlined who's going to be in charge who's going to be in charge conservation open space the signature page is it's going to come to this board and it's going to be transparent again if there's any. Who's in charge of running the meeting that's open to the public? Conservation. Okay, so I don't support that. It, the Warren article specifically said the Open Space Preservation Commission. I have complete respect for the Conservation Commission, but this was a town meeting vote that the Open Space Commission had the lead role. Conservation will have to weigh in on whether they're adopting the or going to hold the CR. 
I'm, I'm saying the working group, when you have these joint meetings, I've been to enough of them, you, you, have, you don't have the amount of work accomplished. You need a working group that's sitting down and working and crafting. And you don't do that at a joint meeting with taking comment from the public. It doesn't happen. All right, why don't I, st I'm not gonna pit one group against another another committee. First of all, I think you you both add a lot to the town, so I'm not gonna go down that road. Well, then why don't we suggest that the conservation agent, who's a full-time employee of the town of South Row and a member of Open Space, review it, make comments, and then have a joint meeting with both committees. Where are the neighborhood members? Where are That's the, the purpose of a joint committee. To me, it sounds like we're, we're doing exactly what you don't want. You're going to have a very small group of people working on something that's not going to be open to the public. I'm trying to prevent that from happening. I don't think it matters who's going to be in charge. If you're working together as a group with the support of the residents, no one needs to have you know, a title. I mean, if you want me to make you in charge, I'll make you in charge. It's, Open space. This isn't be, about me being in charge. I'm sorry. But that's sorry. what I said. I don't see conservation not being responsible to have. It's the about the the different. All right, I, I make role a motion. that the open space commission has when we are reviewing open space issues. We have a different perspective and a different set of knowledge and values than conservation. That's what we bring to the table. And I think. I just don't think that having a subcommittee is that big a deal. You have them for the golf course. Not all the golfers in town are on it. You know, I think having this where you have somebody from the neighborhood who was actively involved, they can pick a rep. Conservation can pick a rep. I think we can get something that we just agree on, and I think it's becoming a bigger deal to have the subcommittee than it really is. All right, I'll make a motion that we have a committee of the Conservation Commission open space, and Ms. Gillespie will be the responsible individual of that committee to inform the community, and all meetings will be televised. I think we would want to add others to that. Yeah. Fine. The, the, the you know, and that's why I think, I agree with you, Alicia, I think that there are others that need to be considered. I think that the golf course committee needs to be considered here. I mean, if they need to continue to make a, a run a viable golf course, they need to be a player at the table and, and how this discussion. conservation restriction is put together as well. So, and I think uh, a uh, member personally, of the public. Yeah, personally, I think strong arguments have been made by the chair of no. both the Conservation Commission and Open Space um, on this working group. And I think that should be the first step. We draft a charge. That we go to and, and look to membership. create that at our next meeting. I don't know if there's any, anything else you'd like to add? I, I presume on that basis, uh, special counsel would wait until this committee is formulated and, and get additional comments before a further draft of the CR is created. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, there would be a participant in that working group meeting as well, okay. so. Okay. Okay. Then we will advertise for membership of that committee even if we don't have a charge right now. We can do that. Is it and so we'll is approve it, the charge at our next meeting. Is that going to be consistent with the comments that were provided by Open Space? Thanks. So that we're having a member of conservation, member of, um, well, they had, they had recommended a representative from Board of Selectmen, Open Space, Conservation Commission, Rec Commission, and Golf Course Subcommittee. I, I, I don't think the Board of Selectmen need to be on it. I think like everything else, I think we ought to yep. offer It'll eventually come to, to you us. and <coughs> you can do your magic and draft putting together uh, the first draft based right. on Did the that consensus. Did that show with a deadline? Did that or a member of the public at large in there? Mark, is that in there? We can do that and put I'd that, like I'll add, add that, that in as well. Okay. So I can get that advertised tomorrow in anticipation of the charge. All right, yeah. okay. And with a, com a reasonable deadline. Uh, you will have to ask councils when they would need something. Okay. Mr. Beals. Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Whitney Beals, 10 Chestnut Hill Road. Uh, I signed, uh, was sworn in to be a member of a subcommittee, so I guess I jumped the gun um, last week um, not, and would be happy to serve. 
I just want to support the notion that there be a subcommittee and want to comment that at this point in the process, the attorney shouldn't be driving what's happening. And I say that because the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs has a very tight boilerplate conservation restriction out there. And if you stray very far from that uh, model, then it's just going to get hung up at EOEA when the Division of Conservation Services has to review the restriction. Okay, They'll, and there's always back and forth. I'm, I'm a veteran of drafting and getting conservation restrictions approved. Lisa, you, you may not know, but there was a, another big one here in town a few years ago, 2006 was it, uh, on Chestnut Hill Farm. I have worked with Aldo on that um, and would be happy to, to work on this one. Um, but there has to be transparency um, throughout and there has to be input from a lot of different stakeholders. I mean, this one differs from a typical conservation restriction, I think, in that it will be an active golf course, but that's fine. EOEA has seen those kinds of restrictions before. Okay. Thank you. Well. Should the charge, the, um, the time frame for the subcommittee run in parallel with the end date that we had for the conservation restriction? Wasn't there an end date yes. for 2018? I think we should take that into consideration. I don't think it needs to go, you know, just to keep that in mind when creating the charge. Sure. Okay. Uh, if I may just add something on, sure. on that score um, in terms of timing. There was a reference earlier to a former state employee, uh, I, I think I know who you were talking about, who had previously overseen conservation restrictions. She wrote the handbook. Uh, she was the person in charge of reviewing draft CRs. She has uh, left EEA. Um, and in her absence, we have noticed that there has been a pretty significant increase in the amount of time that it takes uh, really to go through this process. So the most recent experiences my, my firm has had and, and talking with others, it's, it's been pretty similar. Six to eight months uh, typically is the time once you engage really with EEA that you need to expect to see the process through it in its entirety. Um, so I, I mention that only because where we're talking about timelines, and I think we have a deadline in, in maybe yes. mid-2018, uh, I think that really hopefully underscores the importance of getting the ball rolling here quickly with these things. Uh, we're certainly all in favor of a collaborative process, and we're happy to get as much input as we can before we start drafting. I think that's only going to help the final product, but uh, time is of the essence here. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank sure. you. Thank you. All right. All, that will all be on our next agenda. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, next item, discussion of notice of intent to sell for 135 Deerfoot Road parcel. So, correspondence uh, dated August 28th, 2017. Our board received notice from the owners, or attorneys representing the owners at uh, 135 Deerfoot Road of the intent to sell the property. The property is currently in Chapter 61A protection. Uh, and quarterly, the town of Southboro has a right of first refusal to, um, is right to, to enforce that action to, uh, under the right of first refusal to, off, to match the offer that is presented to the owners. Uh, and we are here to discuss that tonight. Um, I know that there has been one question raised, which has been answered by town council about whether or not this is in fact a bona fide offer. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so I guess just to, to start, is there any appetite on the board to challenge whether or not this is a bona fide offer and inform the owners that we do not think that it is? So I do not wish to go down that road as well. So I think we need to... Uh, make a decision to and offer, uh, send correspondence to the attorneys representing the owners of our intent to, to act or not to act. So we have reached out to other town boards and committees to get their input uh, and recommendations to us on this matter. Um, and I know there were other boards and committees that were included in the correspondence from the owners, attorneys, planning board, board of assessors, conservation commission, and also the town clerk. Uh, we've also invited Open Space Preservation Commission 
So I will start if uh, the planning board uh, has any comments or recommendations regarding this parcel. Good evening. Good evening. Don Morris, planning board. Had, had the hay fever going. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when we were invited to this meeting, um, I asked the uh, town planner to look for, uh, there was a report, I think it was in the, within the last 10 years, uh, that identified um, or uh, it analyzed the, uh, the, the, the ability of the town or the impact of the town to uh, allow uh, large parcels like this uh, to go to the open market and become residential housing units versus open space. And uh, we can't find that report. We're still looking. But my memory tells me that it was uh, very clear that uh, once you create a residential lot, uh, it, it, it creates like a, uh, a conveyor belt of um, children that uh, will continuously uh, stress the schools. And, and as we know, I, I believe the report indicated that uh, the tax rate uh, for, uh, to uh, compensate for uh, educating a child, that every residential unit uh, in the town uh, was basically a, a, an additional negative impact on the tax rate. So uh, we're, we're still going to look for that uh, report. The flip side was that um, if the town were to purchase open space, it's a one-shot uh, purchase, and then that's it. The, the, uh, it, it, it no longer uh, contributes to the, um, the population and the impacts uh, related there, too, which would be children plowing a, a new street, uh, the other public uh, services. So we wanted to bring that here tonight, uh, and maybe we'll find it. But I believe that the uh, planning board's recommendation relative to these uh, types of uh, properties that are uh, being put out, uh, and we haven't had one in a while, at least not, not one significant, but I know in my time on the planning board, we have, uh, planning board has consistently recommended to the selectmen that the uh, town purchased the, the land for open space. And uh, I believe that it's been, again, the town, the selectmen don't have the authority to purchase the land, but to support a warrant article to put it before the people, to see if the people want to uh, come up with the money to purchase the open space, to purchase it, the land as open space, or for something else that would uh, be a little bit different than a residential uh, housing lot. And it's my memory that uh, the selectmen have consistently not supported uh, even bringing the, those uh, parcels, other than the, the, the Beals' uh, recent uh, uh, action. But prior to that, there were countless uh, agricultural parcels throughout the town. The planning board uh, recommended uh, a warrant article to consider purchasing and uh, those warrant articles were not brought forward. So uh, I think our position, and you know, we haven't discussed this as a, as a board, but uh, just relating back to the way that the, the planning board has approached these over the years would be to uh, suggest a warrant article to see if the townspeople want to purchase it. If the townspeople don't, then fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> uh, it's actually Mark. Did you want to? Okay. I thought the public was going, so I jumped up. But no, I was going to hear from boards and committees okay. first. Sorry. So. Um, okay, so Freddie Gillespie, Open Space Preservation Commission Chair, and um, we brief. We didn't make a recommendation, but we briefly discussed this before we knew there was going to be this meeting tonight. And we wanted to let the selectmen know from the Open Space Preservation Commission that these um, two parcels 
are both listed in the 1999 and maybe prior, I didn't go back that far, but we, we know it's in the current um, town Board of Selectmen approved, state approved, open space and recreation plan. It's a priority parcel. They both also made the list of the Mass Audubon um, priority parcels for habitat in the town. Um, we can provide more detail on that. Many parcels are on our priority. It doesn't mean each one you can protect, but um, we wanted to relay that we felt this one was significant enough to have the conversations and discuss it. I don't think whether um, you go all in or not, I think you need to have some deeper discussions about that. I will say that uh, someone said to me when I brought this up that it was a priority, they said, Freddie, you just got the golf course. <laughs> and that's not how open space protection works. It was 30 years between the town protection of Breakneck Hill and the next project we did <coughs> at Chestnut Hill Farms. We can't control when properties become available. I will tell you that um, I was participating in the last few open space and rec plans and how we, uh, in one of them, how they, the consultant um, determined which parcels were open space priorities. They took the old list and just crossed off everyone that had been developed. We don't have that many left and one becomes available even if another project was recently done. I think it serves the town well, which a town that has always voted for and in survey after survey, highest priority, reason for moving to town, open space comes in at the top. So yes, the Open Space Commission um, recommends doing more research and discussions on this parcel. I'm gonna take my open space hat off and I'm gonna speak as a private citizen. Oh, I'm gonna hear from all the boards and committees. I'm talking as a board though, just to tell you, CPA. Okay. Sorry, I'm the chair of the Community Preservation Committee as well, which is where funding for this type of a project could come from. And that needs to be thoroughly looked in. I can't speak for my committee because we haven't met, but I'm going to say we have discussed this property in the past. So based on that discussion, I will tell you what this property has for CPA. It is the perfect poster child of a CPA project. It has historic buildings, a historic barn, an old home. It has open space, it has some beautiful land there. And dare I say, there's the opportunity to create some affordable housing. The op uh, CPA has hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in accounts waiting for a project. The town could do planning and look, and I'm not trying to talk about putting a project in one neighborhood, but let's have the discussion. A few units where we decide where we want it. I don't think most people in town know that um, the time has, um, the safe harbor we had on Park Central is gone. We are as eligible today as we were before that ever came forth for another, what, 200, 250 units in anyone's neighborhood. If we plan and we create a few units ourselves, 17, I think it is, we get safe harbor for two years, you know, we could start putting together a plan using the CPA money. And I'm just saying, I'm not saying that, I'm an open space commissioner, open space, but sometimes these projects if you want to do um, historic preservation of the barn, you could turn it into maybe some housing or maybe the house into some co-housing for veterans. There's a lot to be done and I think it deserves thoroughly being looked at. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Mark, please. Hi, Mark Passamato, Conservation Commission. <clears throat> um, we as a conservation board haven't discussed this parcel in a lot of detail. Um, it was on our agenda as a, um, as a um, other business item as we knew that this meeting was coming up this week and you were, you were gonna be considering this. Um, 
my understanding or our understanding is uh, there's two parcels. One is about 27 acres that's on the um, um, westerly side of Deerfoot, the south side of Deerfoot Road of Route 9, and it's about 7.6 or so that's on the um, easterly side of Deerfoot on the top of the hill. That actually abuts a piece of property that the town has that they were considering put a water tower there or may do at some point in the future. So, <clears throat> I mean, we haven't uh, spent a lot of time looking at this land. Um, our conservation um, agent did a little uh, digging and this, this property has a score of a 3.25 for its desirability for open space out of a 10. So it's kind of a lower priority from that standpoint if you're into numbers. Um, that, that just being said. So uh, again, you know, I think um, um, you know, one of the pieces of property, the one that's on the um, westerly side of Route 9 down in the back corner as it get closer to the EMC land um, is wet. Um, so there's not really much you can do in there in terms of hiking or, you know, recreation or anything. It's just, you know, wet swampy kind of lands back there. So, um, you know, we really haven't spent a lot of time on it, haven't made a, a vote or a consideration one way or another as a board. Um, so, but uh, as, as a planning board, um, Mr. Morris said, you know, Warren Articles putting in front of the town, looking at this further, um, <clears throat> you know, might be, you know, very viable and something that, that we should do. I just want to make a correction because I can't let that stand out there. Um, the 3.25 <laughs> is the highest number is 4, not 10, 4 something, I think. I don't think anyone hit 5, so it's not like the lowest priority. And that was only based on wildlife habitat. It didn't look into many, there are many other reasons why you protect open space. That was one reason, and it's a great reason, but it's not the only reason. Thank you. Other town boards, committees? Ms. McDaniel. I'm Donna McDaniel, <clears throat> speaking for the Southboro Historical Society, which I have to say is totally reinvigorated and has the most beautiful museum if you haven't been there, go and hear it today. It's incredible. So we're talking in this proposal about uh, some of the most historic land and a, s a historic section in our town. And so our argument would be that uh, preserving it and, and including it in our historic treasures, which we seem to be building up slowly but surely, that that would be greatly desired. Thank you. Uh, are there others from the public that would like to offer comments? Mr. Beals. Whitney Beals again. Um, I've walked that property with a potential home, home buyer, property buyer, back in the spring. Um, it's uh, Portions of it are a wet woodland. I think they'd be very conducive to hiking trails. We don't know what EMC is going to be doing in the future. Um, it could well set aside some of its land as permanent open space. It would be a wonderful connection to have that. And it's my did you just receive notice of this um, change of use? Um, Late August, August 28th. And you have 120 notice. days to respond, is that correct? 120 days to act, to act correct? To act, right. So um, there's still quite a bit of time left, well, which is terrific. There's no need for a decision to waive the town's rights at this point in time. I would strongly support folks who spoke before me to let's take a hard look at this and the real possibilities of protecting it as a permanent open space for the town. Others? No other comments. So, uh, Mr. comments S from the board. Could we have Mr. S Attorney Cipriano give the community an update on the process of short version of what's being asked of us this evening? The short version? Yes. For the viewers at home. <laughs> <laughs> For the viewers at home, what's being asked of us this what's evening? What's being asked yes. of you? This, this property. You're going to need a microphone. You need a Sorry. Microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, this property is uh, in uh, Chapter 61 Forest Land uh, dedication, uh, which in effect. Um, uh, holds back on taxes until such time as it's converted. It's called a rollback tax. 
And uh, because of the nature of the land under either 61A or 61, a municipality gets a technical right of first refusal on a bona fide offer, which is considered to be a good faith offer. We have concluded that what is being offered to you is a bona fide offer and a good faith offer. So the town has this 120 days in which to act. And of course, the selectmen can advance it to a, a town meeting, but ultimately it's the town meeting, obviously, as the appropriating legislative authority that has to make the final decision. So th that is your time clock. Uh, you're, you're two weeks into it at this point, or two and a half weeks into it. But um, you, know, you, you never want to wait. If you're going to take an action, you never want to wait too long. But you, you do have that 120 days. Thank you. So, and yes, we do have the 120 days, but the reality is the tail end of that 120 days pushes us, you know, towards Christmas and a couple of weeks before Christmas, and I don't think that there is, an, uh, there's not an appetite on my part to try and schedule a special town meeting to act on this, you know, on the 20th of December or thereabouts. So I think that if we are going to act, I think we need to act relatively quickly so we can get this done as soon as possible so that you know holiday impacts don't uh, con interfere with the process. Mr. Beals. That makes good sense. Uh, I would just point out that part of the statute allows for the town to assign its first refusal option. Uh, the selectmen can do that uh, to a nonprofit organization that guarantees that at least 50 percent or more, a little over 50 percent of the land will be protected permanently in open space. So that could allow for a mix of uses. I happen to be president of the Southboro Open Land Foundation, too. Uh, this is new to us. We haven't had a chance to discuss it um, and would be happy to do that. Sudbury Valley trustees might be interested in helping with um, a takeout of the property and then spinning off part of it to recoup some of the, its investment. Southboro Open Land Foundation will look at that, too. So there, that's a really interesting option that's part of the withdrawal process. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would mention that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I may, Mr. Shea. Sure. Um, I would be interested, Ms. Gillespie brought up an interesting point about the potential opportunity for affordable housing there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting uh, to hear from Shopsy on their thoughts on a potential use of this parcel. We've heard from open space, we've heard conservation, we've heard planning. I think it would be you know, important for us as well to uh, request a opinion from them as well. Okay. And historical, historical, along with recreation. Correct. <coughs> Sorry, thank you, Barney. Okay. Mr. Passamato. Um, yeah, I was just going to add that um, at our next meeting, we can make this a formal agenda item, discuss it as a board. Um, maybe some of the members can go out there and walk the property that haven't seen it or been there in quite some time as um, Mr. Beals has walked it and is familiar with it. And we can provide the selectman with a recommendation from the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman. You're going to need to go to a microphone, though, please. Good evening. I'm attorney Wayne LeBlanc. I represent uh, the homeowners who are here before you, Mr. and Mrs. Dowd. I'm the one that sent the letter in and, the, and uh, entertained the process. So I'm certainly here for any questions the board may have or anyone else may have tonight that the board would like to uh, respond to. And I certainly can work with um, your town council regarding any matters and how you want to proceed at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate you coming. All right. I'm going to suggest we advance it to a town meeting, but these groups have to come in and tell us what potential uses they would like to see for that parcel and what kind of a calendar are we talking about, if not December. So we've had some preliminary discussions. Um, I've, I've had conversations with the town clerk and also um, with the moderator, and uh, it looks like that last week of November probably would be the time where availability sets up, Trotter is available, clerk has gotten out of the special uh, special election to fill the fifth seat on this board, and uh, the moderator is available as well. So, and that would give us, that would give time for people to do their homework and, and to figure that out. Obviously, we've got to figure out what we're going to right. do with the parcel because that's going to affect the funding 
options for the right. parcel. Correct. So assuming that time frame, a late November special town meeting, how much notice do we have to give before the special town meeting is called? And how long is a warrant open? And what does that, moving those, having those dates move backward, what does that mean for us? So you determine how long you'd like to keep the warrant open. It's got to be posted two weeks, 14 days prior to the meeting. So it determines how long you want to keep the warrant open. Are you, do you want this to be the sole agenda item mm -hmm. um, for, the, for a special town meeting? That's really the discretion of the board. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, I mean, again, I'll, there's been excellent points and excellent comments that have been raised. And the other point, as someone who is, you know, elected to represent the citizens, this does not come at, at zero cost as well. And we've just asked the mm -hmm. people in this town to, to help fund a public safety project and obtain the number one, I just said it, the number one open space parcel in town. So we have that. Um, that obviously has a tax impact. This will have a tax impact as well. Um, we've just heard a presentation earlier on uh, the capital items that we're looking at as well, which is going to, again, covers items that have been pushed back a number of years and are items that we just can't push back on anymore. So there's a lot of capital items, a lot of expenses facing everybody in this town as well. So all the good comments that have been offered also needs to be weighed against uh, the, the tax impact. So. Uh, Ms. Well, Gillespie. Uh, I just, oh, oh. No, that's all right, good. I think we're so, gonna say the same I thing. Think so. <laughs> it's not, um, CPA has money that doesn't yeah. increase your taxes. It's not like you're not paying for it. We never claim that it's not. It's a surcharge on your taxes. You're already paying for it. Some of these monies are already in like savings, account. we call them buckets, but in accounts. I'm not saying, I don't know, I mean, we have our funding round coming up. We haven't looked at all the applications. It's a time when we're a little bit uh, more, our, our buckle's a little tighter than it had, our belt's a little tighter than it had been. But depending on if you used one of the accounts that has a lot of money in it, and that was one of the reasons why I looked at affordable housing because uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but there's, there's quite a few hundred thousand dollars there. And it, it can be done in a way, if it's planned, that does not have a negative impact on the neighbors and that can do the historic preservation and still allow you to preserve a lot of the open space. Having said that, though, for CPA, which I'm not saying the committee would vote to support this, but I don't even know if we would have enough to fund it all, but no matter which way you go with CPA, you have to identify what you're protecting and how much is open space and how much is a, you know, if you're doing his, some for historic, I mean, you could do all three. You just have to identify and have real good faith efforts on allocating the cost. You can't say it's all for affordable housing and, you know, most of it's for open space. And that needs to be done so sooner than later, I think. say this. Uh, Marguerite Landry, 134 Deerfoot resident. I'm right next door to the Dowd's property. Um, at this point in time, uh, most of the neighbors do not support the town purchasing this property. Um, we feel we would have no control over what happened with it. Playing fields, water tank, we don't know. Um, more housing, we don't know. Um, currently, we're more comfortable with the um, planned uh, developer purchasing it. Thank you. Thank and you. I think I speak for about maybe 20 surrounding households. Thank you. So, put it on for the third? Third. 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 Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, next, last appointment. Presentation of the IMA with the Town of Ashland for supplemental water. Ms. Galligan. Could you restate that this is going to appear again on our third agenda? I think we're going to Mr. Chairman, members, am I released? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's 
This is going to be an agenda item on our next meeting on the 3rd. All right. So, can you them out. clear them out so we can uh, continue? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ms. Galligan. So while this, so while this is, uh, while the the uh, presentation is is coming up, let me just uh, preface this. <clears throat> this is an issue that has been, I don't know, four years in the making, at least. Yes, uh, uh, actually know, more this, than ten. Yeah, the original the original IMA that was done was actually done when I was sitting in another seat in another town, <laughs> um, dealing with this town. <laughs> so, this was something that. Um, uh, you know, has, has been in process for a while. There's been a lot of work and effort on this. Um, I've actually um, worked on it now on both sides uh, when, when I was in Ashland and now here. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Um, she can go through the details. You did have a memo in your packet um, that kind of gave you some information. So um, I'll, I'll just let Karen run through uh, the presentation. If you have any questions, ask me. So actually, this is um, not that this means a lot to you, but this the connection where if you look at that map right there, where 90 is down at the bottom, the Interstate 90, um, you see Oak Hill Road goes basically into Ashland. So right, Oak Hill kind of it actually stops, and then you see the water main kind of comes down, and that's Walnut, and it scoots over, and you see two hydrants where those two hydrants are. That's actually the connection. This, yep, this is the, um, our low pressure zone of the town right now. So um, the Oak Hill tank and the Overlook tank and the Hosmer pumping station are what feeds this. Um, so Ashland's water system, they sell water to Hopkinton. And we've kind of gone over this before, so it'll be quick. Um, they get water from wells at the Hopkinton Reservoir, and those wells are influenced by the reservoir levels. DCR Dick controls the reservoir levels. Um, and so the, those reservoir levels, they have no control over them, but that's what dictates the water restrictions. So every year, Ashland and Hopkinton go through pretty strict water restrictions. Um, in 2007, we had that first emergency water sh shortage where we sold Ashland water. Um, it's been, it's gone, gone through t two other times, but they didn't use it in 2013. They only used it in 2016. It was the same thing. Um, they probably took, it was, you know, it's not a lot. They, and their, their problem time is actually in October. So we had thought we might have some issues trying to give it to them, but um, that's not the case because our high usage, we drop off the minute September comes, and that's when they start having their hardest recharge problems. Um, so we've done this twice now, but had it, have, had it open and ready for three times. Um, it's a, so the permanent, whoops. The permanent connection that we're talking about, um, Ashton's been looking for this because of their water issues for over a dec decade, since 2007. Um, they researched permanent connection through the MWRA. They did some feasibility work through that um, coming through Southboro. They did get approval from the MWRA for up to 1.6 million gallons a day um, to c from the MWRA. They received a MassWorks grant and a financial contribution from the rail district. And that, um, that was something that Ashland, they, they have a huge, uh, the rail district is basically over by their Ashland station. 
so they got a lot of money for that to and to provide them water they also it all kind of came together in this large grant that they have for money um, so the connection to do the to do the in, the infrastructure in South Road that they need to do and then other work that they have to do in Ashland it's 1.8 million dollars the other work they have to do in Ashland isn't included in that but there's a the actual connections in Ashland um, so that's part of that 1.8 um, it's fully funded through Ashland Southboro is not paying anything for this um, the Southboro water improvements actually that would be in our master or are in our current master plan would have been in it for the next one that we're in the process of doing however this if this work gets done it won't be in our obviously in our plan um, but it's about seven hundred thousand dollars worth of Hosmer station upgrades that includes pump pump work that actually gives us our future needs and up, gives 1.6 million gallons a day to Ashland um, and then there's a redundant water main at Hosmer there's a, a length of pipe that if it goes down that basically the whole station is useless because it's just pumping into really the reservoir um, so it's it's putting a second pipe right there um, till the point where that where where we do have redundancy um, other improvements um, the permanent um, connection be it Oregon Road it's got MWRI meter um, it's got our SCADA system Ashland SCADA system so we can all read see what's happening an altitude valve on overlook tank and um, then there's other money in there for construction administration and contingency and I just put it in under other improvements um, but that could technically be under our piece too um, the agreement it's a 25-year agreement Ashland pays 100% of the design and construction costs um, we wanted to use our engineer so our engineer designed the projects they know our system um, our over engineer will oversee the construction um, and be the project manager for us um, again it's designed 1.6 million gallons a day um, this design again it incorporates our future needs and Ashland's request so it's not it's not just for Ashland it actually is doing what we need done um, they're estimating construction to be completed in 2018 in the fall so that they want to be able to to use this connection next year um, Ashland's paying MWA directly for the water which is works for us so it doesn't count towards our cost to MWRA um, they're going to pay our operation and maintenance costs on a per gallon basis so they're the way we ended up um, figuring out what they should pay was we took our actual operating costs our, our budget took out the cost of the water we pay MWRA and then we divided that up by how many gallons we pumped in that year and we came up with a per gallon cost um, but since there's only a section of the town that's really being used or the piping that really technically is going to be working towards Ashland we went to 10% of what that value is um, so again Ashland's water use is going to be metered by the MWRA who they'll pay direct the agreement doesn't limit our removal from the MWRA doesn't affect our contract with them at all and um, we're responsible for the maintenance of the assets in Southboro but we would be anyway so we, we're not adding any asset that we wouldn't really be adding anyway or changing and um, so the summary Southboro we get a needed system improvements at no cost <coughs> we recover our O&M costs and Ashland gets the water they need okay. a couple quick questions I have do you know is, is Ashland going 100% NWRA water or are they no. going to combine it is combined Combine. all right uh, and the improvements that we have will that prevent the backflow of water from Ashland back into South Borough? there is going to be a backflow in the um, in the in the pit the meter pit okay so I, th there have been some communities that have had water chemistry issues with well water and MWRA water and I don't want that making to come back backwards to into our system yes um, and so they'll do you know if Ashland will continue to sell to Hopkinton as well? And yes. That, so they that are, yep. They will still be selling, and um, they're, they're still working out that IMA. Okay. 
So just did one other piece with that. So Hopkinton does have other wells, but I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that they have manganese issues. And so the water that they get from the Hopkinton Res um, uh, uh, wells is much better quality water. Mm -hmm. So this may allow, and that's between Ashton and Hopkinton, that they can figure out whether they're going to renegotiate um, how much water that Hopkinton is able to take from those wells. So I, I, it would all depend, I, you know, this is, I th still think that's gonna be their primary, um, the, the aquifers underneath uh, the, the Hopkinton Res are still gonna be Ashland's primary water source. This is going to be their backup for when those times when, and as Karen said, you know, DCR needs that water to go over and, and, and um, take care of the beach, you know, at, at the state park. And that is DCR's priority conflicts with the water, the water priority, you know, for Ashland. Okay. Last question for me. Do you know, and I should, I didn't see it in there. Do you know if, does this have a clause that this agreement continues until a new agreement is in place? I All don't the conditions believe it does have of that. Because I've seen issues with municipalities and intermunicipal agreements where it has expired and mm -hmm. one community says, okay, I don't, have, I don't owe you anything anymore until a new agreement is in place. So yeah, I would like, like to see the, the green and it, we have 25 years, but uh, you know, if 25 years comes and people don't realize this needs to be renewed, then yeah. uh, we should protect ourselves so that the, condition, the terms and conditions continue until the new agreement is in place. Yeah, because um, I mean, we do have, if either of us need to opt out for any reason. We have opt out clauses and how that gets paid back to the capital, but um, which is it zero percent in the last um, five years of the, that we would end up having to pay back to them if we opted out. If they opt out, it doesn't matter. So, the, so currently right now under the renewal, the renewal commences on or before four years before the end of the term of the agreement, section 20.4. Point one. So then if you get to a year prior to the end of the agreement and you still have not achieved a, a renewal, um, then the parties go to, um, uh, you know, then uh, have the matter go before Mass DAP, uh, Mass DEP, um, and, and work it and work it at that, at that level. There, so there is no, you know, councils worked on this and there is no continuity agreement as you're saying, mm -hmm. but you're starting four years in advance and there are triggers where other parties get involved or more, you know, more people get involved <coughs> the closer that you actually get to the end date. So whatever date this is, could you set an outlook reminder? Yes. To open this up. My predecessor can do that, yes. Yeah. So. Successor. Successor. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> other comments? Doesn't I right. just I just have a pet peeve. Could you put the date on the bottom of each page this evening if we approve this? Yes. Well, I'm going off we your letter. I don't know if that's the date you want on this. So. No, I th we would have to put the date it was yeah. signed by. Right. Actually, the date it's executed fully, which would be once they signed and we signed, right? Right. We would be we, so Ashland. Ashland's board of selectmen have already approved this. Um, they would. We would have them sign the documents, then send them to us. But yes, we could put the date on the bottom um, for the document. Just as a reference to this meeting that we have a date. Ms. Brasher. Uh, just a few questions, Karen. Um, and again, this isn't my forte, so these will probably be very easy questions I for hope you to easy. answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I know you said the end date of the construction would be the fall of 2018. If, yes. the, if this is executed, I would assume relatively quickly, what would the start date be approximately? Would it be the spring? Um, I don't know. The time. They, would be, they would be do probably the water main work in the spring and the um, vault in the spring, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't shut down the, like they wouldn't do the pump work until next fall. So that would really be the, the end step, okay. but it should be spring. Okay. Um, under the leak identification on 5.1.1, I don't know if you have the document. I don't have it in front of me, but I, okay. well, I have it in front of me. Yeah, it says um, South Brown Ashland shall each maintain and fund a continuous leak identification program. I just 
do we have a program like that yes. in place? And is that funded through your budget? How yes. is that funded? So currently that's that's part of our budget. We And it's really just a once a year leak detection. Um, you run through the town and, and check for leaks. Um, so we do that every year. Um, so it's actually part of that O&M cost. Okay, so that was easy. Um, under the 8.1.6, Southboro shall provide quarterly and annual water flow summaries to Ashland. Is this normal and do we currently, well, I guess I know the answer to that now. We currently don't supply water to other towns. So is this a new process that we're, you're going to put in place or? Um, it, yes, it, it, but it's, um, it's not very, we get, we get a monthly report from MDVRA what we've pumped and then we also have, we, daily check what we've pumped to make sure everything's even. Um, so we'll just, all we have to do is say, this is how much we pumped. That way they know over that quarter, they have, a, they have an idea how the operation's going. Because if we, if it's, it's a weird thing, but if we don't pump a lot of water, our, our O&M costs don't go down, mm -hmm. but so they'll end up paying more, right, per, Per gallon than on a, on a dry on a wet year than they would on a dry year. It's kind of a weird process. So it kind of gives them an idea what this, and that's a, next year they can they can budget it appropriately when they set their water rates. Okay. I mean that's under obviously under your forte, but it was just a, a question I had. Um, also under the 16.1 maximum allocated capacity, 16.1.2, in the event Ashland exceeds 80 percent of its maximum allocated capacity for average daily flows. Over any three-month period, Southboro may expand the pump station and or the vault connection. In such event, Ashland will pay part of the cost. So I guess my question is, if they exceed 80% and it increases the flow and of the capacity, I, I'm just questioning why they would only pay a portion of it. Well, it's, it's proportional, if you, if you finish that, proportional to its share of the increased maximum capacity. Okay. So if the increased capacity is solely due to Ashland, they're going to own that. They're, but but if, if we're getting some benefit out of it, maybe they're paying 80% of the cost. Okay. Yeah. And again, these may be repetitive and easy questions to answer, but they were things that I flagged. Um, um, I think they proved you read it. <laughs> I certainly <laughs> you know? did. And one final, just one final question, and it's probably going to reflect back to the same mark, is under 1.5.2 repair. Repairing, uh, fixing or replacing a deteriorated system sections of the project site. Repair does not include replacement or expansion of the water system for the purpose of expanding capacity referred to as plan expansion under 1.6. Repair does not cover increase in the pump station capacities. So I'm just trying to read my notes here on this one. Um, do we need to expand? I don't know why I wrote that. Um, so I think this clause is basically based on the idea that if we have a water main break, we have to maintain the water rate, we have to fix it. Correct. If, if we need to do something because our town's grown, we've got a bottling plant in, and we need to increase our capacity, right. Bastion's not going to bear any of that cost because it's 100% our issue. But if they happen to get a bottling company and we get a bottling company, that goes back to the first one where you say, all right, we both expanded too much and now that the connection is not going to work and we need more so that's when you'd start sharing it okay that was it for me again they were probably easy questions for you but I'm just trying to understand the process of water thank you yeah. I think I think overall Lisa if, if you look at that I mean it was it's it's the things that are um, um, you know have limited without you know that include you know um, things such as maintenance replacement equipment cost right. operation repair so that we make sure that you know we're not assuming some things that may not be you know um, of our doing absolutely okay we want to make sure everybody is taking care of, of, of yeah. their own here and um, uh, you know like I said I, I think this is it, it's kind of a win-win situation we're getting thing we're getting improvements to our system which are included in our master plan which would have to be paid for by our rate payers um, that are being paid for instead by Ashland and um, you, again, then get the warm feeling in your heart for being um, the good neighbor um, and being able to provide them. And it basically being a pass-through for the MWRA um, rather than forcing them to try and, and find a way to do um, a, a direct connection, which having tried to look at that, 
for a number of years, um, you know, on, on both water and sewer fronts presents a tremendous challenge um, given that a lot of those things have to go, um, you know, through Framingham or in the other direction. I mean, obviously I'm in support of, of them paying to upgrade yep. yeah. up repairs that we may need to our system. I mean, that's a win for the town, but. Yep. There's, there's gotta be an apple. Yep. So. <laughs> and that's a bean counter I made out. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank and you. again, so we meter water at the Hosmer pump station. Yes. And there's going to be a meter at the connection. Correct. So, in a, so theoretically, our meter minus their meter equals South Borough's usage. Correct. And then theoretically, everybody's water meter in that zone adds up to that exact yes. same amount. That's what we try to <laughs> <That happens. laughs> so We're okay. a little bit off of that, but yes. So, but it is, and it is right at the connection point, though. Yes. And, and, and again, is. that is why there's the sharing of the of the meter data, just so there's the two communities can reconcile. Yes. The, um, all the data. And, and the, it actually doesn't stay open all the time, so they're, they're going to notify us when they open it. It's not a year-round opening yep. connection, so that's one of the reasons, too, is that once we see, they'll, they'll notify us that they're taking it, but then we'll be able to monitor what they're taking. Yep. Okay. And with their meter at the connection, if they have a water main break or f high fire usage, they're paying for that water. Right. And, and likewise, and we, we are. They can, we and are, they, we can shut end. the connection off at that point, too, if they have a break. Either of us can say, oh, we should shut that connection. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we need to vote this yes. tonight. Uh, that would be uh, preferable. Okay. So uh, I'll make the motion that we approve the IMA with the town of Ashland for supplemental MWRA water. I'll second that motion. Motion seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Thank Karen. You. Thank you. Uh, chairman's report. Dan? <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> Mark? Anything beyond the capital plan? Uh, I had just two, uh, two quick items. Uh, the first one is that the, um, 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 we did receive, um, and I say we, and I'll explain that in a second, receive uh, notification back from MassDOT that both the heavy commercial vehicle exclusions that we submitted for Deerfoot and for Parkerville, um, both were denied. Um, the reason I say we is because the letters are addressed to Mr. Kalenda. However, we've not received our copy yet. I had to get these copies from Ms. Galligan. Um, she got her copy first. Uh, so, um, but I'm sure the information is not gonna change. Um, and so I will make sure that the, uh, uh, the residents up in that area provided that information uh, as well. And uh, just one other piece um, of information, um, I have um, uh, continued to uh, try and reach out uh, to Ms. Malley uh, at National Grid, um, and uh, still, uh, as of yet, uh, today was the latest attempt, have not uh, gotten any uh, correspondence back from her yet um, regarding uh, Mr. Perry's project. So we're still in a holding pattern there. All right, thank you for that effort, too. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. Uh, we've approved item eight. Uh, any particular items that people, folks want to no, hold on? Just, I have one edit for the minutes. That was all. Uh, all right. So why don't we take uh, item one, the approved minutes from September 5th. Just uh, one quick edit under chairman's report. Um, second line, uh, Ms. Baraccio spearheaded the Hope for Houston donation event I assisted with. I just would not want to take credit for I, that. I just assisted, so if we could just adjust that, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, as it. amended. As amended. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So items two through seven, two, appoint Mary Mathon to Southboro Scholarship Committee. Three, appoint Isabel Murphy to Southboro Trails Committee. Four, appoint Heidi Davis to Americans with Disabilities Act Committee. Five, appoint Donna McDaniel to Affordable Housing Trust Fund Committee. Six, approve common victualler license for New Rose Garden. Seven, approve Southboro unscheduled for March 18th, 2018. 15th. March 15th, 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll second that as read. Moved, seconded. Uh, I'll just make comment if we could reach out to youth and family services in the schools to for next year to consider uh, a date for unscheduled night after the annual town meeting sure uh, that might uh, be beneficial to the various boards and committees okay all those in favor aye. two through seven aye 
Um, other matters properly before the board, we, uh, the ad hoc committee charge for disposal of 40 and 42 Central Street, Fayville Hall. Uh, there was a draft of the charge in our packet. Uh, are there are comments, suggestions? Uh, the length of time. Uh, so that was actually one of the comments that I had. And, and actually one of the things that I did in preparation for this is I went back to the discussion that we had at the town meeting to where this article was presented. And uh, I think that, th I think that we are, that th creating this committee, I think, is going towards the spirit of the discussion that was at that town meeting. Uh, it wasn't specifically a requirement and language in the, in the committee, but I think in you know, being responsive to comments that were made with respect to an RFP for disposition of this building and the preference to keep you know, to retain the architectural features of it. Uh, Historical Commission, other groups, committees wanted to have uh, a seat at the table was the, the phrase that Mr. Hubley used. Uh, so I think it's smart to do this. Uh, I think that the 120 days is far too long. I think that with the work that the Main Street Design Working Group did in six weeks to review that entire project and have a comprehensive report done before a public hearing. Uh, I think the work that the golf course master planning group did in roughly a six week time frame as well. Uh, I think 120 days is far too long for this committee's charge and I would be in favor of a 60 day um, term. Uh, just, I think that, and I would also, I would be in favor of revising the duties to the review of, of the RFP that is developed um, by the town. Uh, I don't think that it should be this group that develops the RFP. I think it's the town's responsibility to do it. Um, but I think that the, this committee as comprised will be then be able to, in that time frame, offer the comments uh, and feedback into wording of the RFP to, to achieve all the goals that I think everybody wants to have in the disposition of this building. If, if we lengthen the time to 90 days due to all of the holidays coming up and vacations, do you think that would be like a compromise between the two? Because we need to appoint the committee, and I know it now we could run into the beginning of January, but 60 days seems short in the number of, of people in the interest in this building. Okay. I, mean, I, I'll go with the I, I, of the I, will, I can compromise at 90. I think 120 is too long. Uh, I wouldn't go any longer than 90. I had 90. 90. This was what I thought. Okay. Um, I also agree with the review yep. of the RFP. I think that's great. Okay. Fine. Okay. Appointments now. When do you plan on putting that on the agenda? Uh, so we need to solicit an at large representative of the community, preferably a resident of Fayville neighborhoods, which we can advertise tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Which we will. Um, yeah, and I guess if we can reach. Boards, we can, committees we can reach out to to provide and a member. Yep. Yes. A and have them, yep, if they could uh, recommend to us. We'll do that person. Next meeting. Yep. yep that By October 3rd. Give yep. everyone Great. a deadline. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, we'll do the charge as amended. Yes, I move that we approve the charge as amended. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, can public I, comment? Oop, no. I'm sorry. Can I just other add. matters, even though it's not listed yep. here? Yep. A follow-up to the conversation we had earlier about the parcel of land that the town may be interested in pur purchasing. Could you have Brian put together a debt sheet if we use any of the buckets or no buckets and also any other outside expenses the town might have to pick up if we purchase the parcel of properties, the piece of property. Because the road, if we own it, then you know you may have road costs to develop anything that goes in there. I think we need to know everything that we might run up against as far as the cost. In respect to what Brian gave us this evening, we really need to be, and I agree with 
what Brian and Lisa said earlier, that that is a roadmap that he provided us as far as debt in this town. Even if we go to town meeting, we need to be prepared to say exactly what this potential Well, one thing, and, 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 and to that point, one thing to consider, too, is that um, the, the interest rates are very good right now. Right. And we've been having discussions with our financial advisor, um, and, and she is saying that we may want to look at doing permanent bonding of some of these um, pieces uh, sooner rather than later. Now that starts to get into issues with if we're going to permanently bond part of the public safety money, right. um, obviously taxpayers are going to feel the impact of that a lot sooner yeah. than yeah. they probably thought they would have. Right. The other piece is we've got to be careful that there are certain requirements once you permanently bond when the money is spent. You can't just bond yeah. it right. and sit just on it on. and everything in that and you end up with all. Yeah. So we, we're looking at those issues. So to your point, it just adds another level of right. And we will need that for the discussion, the next discussion sure. we have, or at sure. least an idea of what direction we might be going in. Yep. Yep. I'm not sure how you want to well, I'll let Brian put that together. I mean, because it, again, it depends on the use. Right. It but he, on, he has knowledge of the monies in those buckets, as Freddie says, that might yeah. be available. I'll bring the town, the town accountant understands the buckets better. <laughs> so I will bring her into the discussion in terms of the buckets and. Okay. I don't want to mislead work. anybody that we have these giant sums out there. No, understood. And, yep. but, and Freddie was clear tonight. Too. I know. A lot of those are committed, you know, those, some of those buckets are committed for other projects. Right. You know, the money that was used for Chestnut Hill, you know, a lot of that, that was paid off, and now that got transferred over to the Burnett House. Right. And could we have it on the screen when we discuss it the next time? The parcel of land sure. that we're talking about and sure. whatever Brian chooses to put together as a helpful information okay. chart. Okay, sure. Mr. Parry. Yeah, good evening. <clears throat> My name is David Parry, 22 Main Street. Uh, now, Mark just referred to this project as my project, which, which, I, which is not, you know, I'm talking about the removal of utility poles on, uh, from Main Street when Main Street gets constructed. It's not my project. It's a, it's a project which is requested by the downtown businessmen and residents living along Main Street, please, not me. Um, I'm doing the work. The trouble is when you do the work, everyone expects it you know, you to continue doing the work, which is some, some you know, it's the way life is, you know, the more work you do, the more they expect you to do. Anyway, well, why I'm here is because, um, you, you know, when I've been here before, now I want to sort of, you know, try and get us onto the same page here, you know, not sort of offensive against each other, but both working towards the same aim and the town's interest. So I was asked to produce a, a, an example, wasn't I, by Mr. Calender. There isn't an example. Give me an example. Well, I discovered an example completely by accident two weeks ago when I went to Hudson. The reason why did I go to Hudson has nothing to do with this. It's because I went because um, Vinnie Patel, who owns Morrow's Market, which I'm the architect for, owns a store in Hudson. So I wanted to see it, you know, to see what, what other products he does. And he has a very nice store there, actually. It's much, much higher quality than here. But then when I was there, I noticed, you know, in the back streets behind Main Street, behind Hudson's Main Street, the back streets are a very tall new pole, relatively new poles, not brand new, but relatively new poles. And they have all these utility wires on them and main electric cables and all kinds of other stuff. I said, my God, and there's wires going from these poles to the back of the buildings. I said, God, you know, are they servicing the buildings from from uh, poles along the back streets, which is exactly, isn't it, what I've been talking about in this alternate system. Much, much cheaper, instead of putting them underground, which cost a fortune, is to you know, provide a new pole system, a new route for the, uh, for the wires and to feed the buildings from the back, which we are already doing, by the way, in this building and in the fire, fire and police station, aren't we, already? Um, well, it turns out, then I went north of uh, Main Street, and sure enough, there are the poles there. So then I called uh, Hudson Electric, and sure enough, the man said, took me some time to get through to the right man, he said, yes, we made this decision because undergrounding was so expensive, we decided to put poles on the parallel streets to Main and feed the buildings from the back. And that, So there's the classic example right next door. I was totally, I was blown away by it because I had assumed, you know, you just assume all the cables are underground, but they're not underground. The only thing underground along my Hudson is, Brian, is the conduit. 
you know, under the sidewalk for the new lamps. And the, by the way, the lamps have little poles out there for flags and, and all kinds of banners and stuff, which raises another issue. You know, do we have VHB, you know, is that included? I want to come to that in a minute. So there, there we have the classic example, Hudson of all places, which, you know, had a, well, I, how do I put it without being, you know, offending anyone, but it didn't have a very good um, reputation, did it, a few years ago, sort of semi-run down industrial town. Now it's, now it's amazing. There's restaurants and all kind of bars and, you know, Main Street's really, really attractive because, because the poles, I think, you know, well, it obviously has something to do with the poles. I can't prove that. But, you know, you, you have these attractive buildings and 19th century buildings opened up, cleaned up. People have cleaned them up because of the poles have gone. And, and so you have this economic activity, which is exactly what we're after. So there is the example. And there's another example, of course, Hudson, I mean Holden and Franklin. If anyone just takes the trouble in this town to drive to Holden, you'll just be absolutely staggered. It's a beautiful town with no poles. It's because there are no poles. It's just absolutely staggeringly beautiful. I lived in Holden. I hadn't been there for like 15 years. And I drive through and say, wow, what an incredibly beautiful town because they got rid of poles. Now, they painted an arm and the leg because they put it underground. They did it, you know, they, they basically did it. Why did it, how did they do it? They, made, they jacked up everyone's electric charges, you know, two cents a kilowatt hour for 30 years, whatever. whatever. The normal process of undergrounding is, is expensive, but you pay for it by, over the number of years by raising everyone's utility charge. And I'm not suggesting we do that. No one supported that originally because, you know, it's a huge cost. But this alternate is a viable solution, and the proof is Hudson. So anyway, just go there and have a look. Now, the other issue is, I just want to mention it as an aside, you know, the, there have been various articles on the Burnett House. I mean, it's quite staggering now. You know, the Burnett House is now looking, you know, so beautiful after millions are being spent on it, you know, except for one thing. The blooming utility poles in front, you know, are on the, are on the Burnett House side of the street. It's kind of ironic. They're on the north, and then they switch to the south right at the Burnett House, it's really just a, such a shame, you know. Anyway, I'm not, well, I mean, this proposal to sort of, to build an alternate track could be extended down the south along the pylon route at considerable, mu much more expense. I'm not advocating it, but it could go all the way to Deerfoot, then up Deerfoot, and so you could get rid of the poles in front of the mansion, but it would add a significant, you know, three times the cost of the proposal I put forward, but it could be done, or the poles in front of the Burnett House could be moved to the north side of Maine, just in front of the Burnett House. Now, I know that might upset the neighbors the other side of the street, but I, coincidentally, those three houses are set incredibly far back from the street, aren't they? I mean, probably 400 feet or more. They're way, way back. And, and the, the problem is the poles, you know, in front of the Bennett House are just huge, huge and ugly. And, you know, they had this row of pines. All the pines have come down. Anyway, I just throw that out to you as, as, a, as a, I don't think, well, you know, it's up to Karen, but, you know, the poles could be moved to the north and would make a huge difference to the Bennett House. So it's sad that, was, you know, John Dilley Priscoli is spending millions and, you know, the darn thing of the entrance is ruined. Anyway, so let me go on to another thing, National Grid. Uh, which is the agency which does the feasibility study and determines whether or not we can move ahead. Now, now I did meet with National Grid with another person, with Miss Malley, Maley Malley. And, um, you know, because you, Brian, met with her beforehand uh, without us, us, meaning the downtown businessmen and residents, so I met with her separately and tried to make the point that, you know, it's not just a sort of in you know, an ad hoc group of nobodies who want this done, but there's a lot of people who want it done. And, you know, what came up at the meeting was rather surprising, because she had, I, mean, I don't want to make a point about this, she had received a letter from the town administrator, Mark, from you, where it said in black and white, dated 8-1-2017, you said in writing, it should be stated that the town does not support this project. Black and white in a letter, and she brought it up to me. So David, why Mr. Well, Perry, it was stated that it's not a town project because it was not a town project. You stated it is I, your I quote, project. I it is your quote, proposal. Your letter said it should be stated 
that the town does not support this project. What right have you to say that? Does the Board of Selectmen support the project, Mr. Well, Mr. Perry? let me ask you, because the two Mr. Town Perry, answer the question, please. Do the Board of Selectmen support the project? So therefore, it is, not, it is not a town project at this point. Why are you speaking point? when I have the floor? Because you're speaking incorrectly, and I'm just no, trying to No, you have no that. right to speak. Chairman, control him, please. So, <laughs> you're the one that asked Mr. Purple the question. Yes. No. No, I'm making a statement. He wrote a letter saying that the town does not support this project. He doesn't, he doesn't represent the town. You do. Have you taken a vote against this project? We are waiting to hear back from National Yes, Grid. exactly. Exactly. You are waiting, and you said the town meeting should decide this issue, because it's that important, didn't you? Several of you said that. The town has never, you have never taken a vote against this project. He wrote that you had, effectively. So he's given her the impression. All right, so, so Mr. Perry, you had started this with wanting to have a cooperative right. spirit, and you're right. going down a much different road. Yes, so I know, you, because I had, want to. You've had over 10 minutes now, if you can Okay, I'm finishing up. right now. Because, you know, there we have it. There we have the representative from National Grid who sees a biased letter right up front and mentions it to me and said, why should I bother? Why should I bother? Why shouldn't I just rule this is infeasible? Right up front. So that's not the way to start negotiations with National Grid, is it? I just put that out there because I don't think it's proper. I think the proper way is for the Board of Selectmen to make clear to National Grid that they want this issue determined by, by town meeting, because it's that important. And by the way, let me just end here right now by saying, um, you know, you, you did support the town meeting vote on this. And I just ask you now, you know, to decisions with BHB, you know, you know uh, the, the, um, the working group, recommended specific things like for instance you know Hudson has put wires in conduit under sidewalks and we learned from Karen that that conduit can be provided at no cost to the town by the state zero cost to the town now has VHB been instructed to do that because it, surely the construction drawings have been submitted haven't they it's the end of September they have not been instructed of that and I just want to go back on one other comment yeah. you made as well that I did not just make the blanket statement that town meeting should decide this I made the statement that there there were a number of unanswered questions that we need to get answered by national grid and if this proves to be feasible since the town does not have the money in place for this it would then need to go to town meeting okay that's fine that doesn't mean you're against it, does it, either? Though. Okay, so, so let's get on to this. How about the conduit? Conduit under the sidewalk. No direction has been given on that yet. But, but surely, aren't we, aren't we up against... Surely, Karen, Karen is here. D d I understood that the construction drawings were so, to be finished. Oh, I'm not going to have okay. any more Chapter 90 money spent on that until we get the answers from National I Grid. I would not recommend it... If other members I of the board I think that's the position this board took, but I don't think we should be debating that yeah. tonight. It's not no, uh, okay, I just I raise it because you know, I'd hate to miss the opportunity of getting free state money to put conduit underneath our sidewalks while we have the chance. That's all. Thank you. I think you'd agree with that. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second that. Well, All those in favor. Got a question. Public. Oh. Second. Yes. But we voted to adjourn. Thank you all.